Okay, very good morning to you. It is Monday the 30th of November. Hope you're doing well. Had a great weekend. Uh, as usual, going to have a quick look around the markets and then also look at a couple of the major events happening this week. Uh, and hopefully we can kind of pick out then potentially what the landscape looks like for the next five trading sessions. And starting off with the overnight session, uh, quite interesting actually, as you can see here from the center charts, I've got the Dow, the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 futures. Uh, and if I was just to look at the S&P, for example, and this was replicated across those three majors, we had a gap up at the initial open. Let me just remove my camera for one moment to make the chart more visible. Uh, but we had a gap up at the reopening of trade. The initial indications when I was putting out my piece on, on Twitter for the week ahead was that the market was set to open up about two tenths of one percent. There was some news coming out um, in regards to uh, more vaccine stuff which we'll get to in a moment so we actually gapped up but we hit basically this trend line that i've been keeping an eye on um, throughout really the initial pfizer spike so this chart i've been continuing to add annotations of some of the key fundamental kind of catalysts and that was that big extreme move that we had in that first response to the pfizer developments back on the ninth of the month we had the retest here um, back on the 24th so tuesday last week and then this was last night, we opened up, we pushed up initially to that trend line and then we've just come all the way back down. We've actually had a pretty sizable pullback in fact and from the high from overnight, the S&P is down about 1.35%. Now importantly, there hasn't been a singular kind of catalyst for that, no real major negative headlines. But remember that it is now the end of the month. It's the last trading day of November, of course. US participants who are largely out of the market since Wednesday, given Thanksgiving holiday and the very quiet Friday volume-wise that we tend to see, uh, they'll be coming back in. So uh, a lot of talk, obviously, on the, the month end about just given the, the size of the, the rally generally that we've had, um, not just in November, but of late, putting us up to all-time highs. If we were to look at things like the Dow, for example, and then a little bit of unwinding of that uh, book squaring of some degree wouldn't be the most surprising thing. The Dow here is already down um, or has been down in excess of 350 um, points this morning. Again, let me just remove my, my camera feed for a moment and then we'll just draw in a bit more of a picture of the, the Dow price movement. So we hit the all time high in the middle of last week, of course. we really busted through that previous double top on the uh, Pfizer Moderna stories, smashing through 30,000 in the futures at least and getting up to around that 30,165 at the high. So continuation a bit of a pullback and this really is the overnight move here. Um, so it's been pretty steep as we've got through what was the low in the futures seen towards the back end of last week and quite a key area here technically I was watching uh, in early trade. Here you've got the S2 level with what was the high on the 11th. There's been a, a area of support in the middle of the month uh, and resistance before the eventual break higher on the 23rd. And we snapped through there and that probably resulted in uh, some of that um, initial follow through on that price movement. It's steadied since, but we're still down beneath that area. And so uh, definitely on the downside next, as I've put on this rectangle, would be an area I'd be watching for the rest of the session that being that low that we can see on the 17th and then that kind of range high through the 19th to the 24th before the move higher and that would be at 29.447 so yeah equity is a little weak but as I said I don't think there's anything uh, massively negative that's happened I think perhaps just a little bit of fatigue on the upside uh, going into month end um, would make the most sense to me at this point in time otherwise in the other asset classes uh, T-Notes not really doing a great deal. I mean, you would expect in a normal type movement for T-Notes to be quite a bit higher with that equity sell-off seen overnight, but that not the case. We're, we're practically flat. We're up just one tick. Uh, in gold, it was quite an interesting move um, that was seen in the overnight session. There was that sell-off uh, that Tim and I were talking uh, the Amplify Live community through when we saw that on, on uh, Friday and remember a lot of that range break but also the fact that given the lower trading volumes you, you do tend to see kind of price movement somewhat exacerbated and that was exactly what we were seeing uh, at the end of last week when gold started to break down uh, and then in the overnight session we actually broke through that level 
of Friday's low to, to print the initial intraday low that's been seen in the futures at 67 spot two. Worth noting overnight in Asia, you did have um, Asian indices were generally lower, the exception being China. And the reason for that, China's factory activity expanded at its fastest pace in more than three years. Their manufacturing PMI came in for November at 52.1 against 51.5 expected. The central bank PBOC also uh, unexpectedly injected funds into the financial system overnight, uh, which typically lends its hand to being more supportive of their local domestic equity market. Um, in the currency markets, then, uh, just a quick look. Uh, the dollar just seeing a little bit of recovery as UK and European early birds come in. Uh, but overall, this is a look at the US dollar index over the period of the last several days. Uh, and this was that initial um, pop we had on the upside when the market got down through and around this key 92 level, which of course we've been watching on a multi-year kind of time frame really important support and resistance area over uh, multiple years. And every time we've got down close to that level, we've seen quite a large kind of rejection and then a move up. But as we've been saying in the last week or two of briefings, the overall trend continues to be a deterioration of the dollar. And that's definitely what we've seen. Uh, although we get these kind of pullbacks that can be quite violent, the overall move has been south. And uh, that again happening overnight. As I said, the dollar index just picking up a little bit. This is a, the, in the futures looking to close the gap on the low from Friday, uh, but albeit still down around one tenth of one percent this morning. So looking at these major pairs here, uh, both slightly supported. Uh, Euro dollar then probably one that's quite interesting to watch for the week ahead because if we put that on the daily, uh, we obviously have broken out of that area that was constricting price on the upside. Uh, so this is looking here at, at the last four or five months worth of price action. And that area around 119.24 uh, was quite key. We we definitely got through there um, in last, well, the end of last week on Friday with the breakout. Uh, and then now looking to target back up around 120, which we know is a kind of symbolic reference point for the ECB where they start to voice concern about the strength of the Euro uh, and how that could impede then uh, the fairly fragile recovery in Europe, given the back of the fact that a number of the largest economies, obviously like Germany, are heavily dependent on exports. Um, otherwise, uh, oil uh, is another one. I'm going to bring up that chart when we get round to the headlines to have a look at, because there's an OPEC meeting happening today, which is particularly important. Um, so we'll have a look at that chart uh, in a moment. So let's get straight into some of the headlines and get you up to speed of what's been going on over the weekend. Um, so this was one of the main things uh, that I saw. This was in the FT and it was talking about the fact that the UK is poised to become the first country to approve Pfizer and buy Entex COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, clearance is possible as early as this week, according to people familiar with the situation quoted in the Financial Times. An emergency US approval could come as soon as the 8th to the 10th of December. So hence the reason why uh, the UK may well be first here. Uh, with shipments in the US, then if that approval can come at between the 8th and the 10th of deck, shipments could start within 24 hours later as everything is getting prepared in advance ahead of time. Um, although British doctors have been put on standby for a possible rollout before Christmas, um, anyone who saw my notes that I tweeted or I put in Amphi Live uh, at the weekend on Sunday, there's two points that I'm looking at, I think, just to be aware of. And point one is, despite the high order volume, so what I was reading at the weekend in regards to this specific Pfizer by the NTech COVID vaccine, is that there's enough with a double dose, obviously, for this particular vaccine to um, vaccinate 20 million people in the UK. Uh, the thing that I wanted to point out on point one then was the speed of manufacturing is likely to be slow to start and companies also uh, have deals to supply hundreds of millions of shots to Europe, the US, Japan and elsewhere globally. So just to make that point more clear, although uh, a lot of the numbers that the politicians have been putting out, obviously uh, they have a slight framing um, objective they're trying to hit which is look we're going to we're going to order and have 20 million shots when that 20 million comes in uh, is a different matter as i said 
Um, especially someone like BioNTech, they're particularly small comparative to some of the other more matured names like your Pfizer's and your Astra's, for example. Uh, and so the ability for them to upscale with these monumental amount of demand that's coming on, given that they're right at the front running in this kind of vaccine race, means that it's not going to be a quick process. So although these, the, these first vaccines may become available, the reality is it's going to be drip fed in um, over time. And, and that really leads me to point two, which is uh, ministers have already said, in regard to the UK at least, uh, that care home residents and workers will be the first in line to receive a vaccine, followed by people aged 80 and over, followed by then healthcare workers and then the wider population. So uh, as you'll remember, we've talked about this quite, quite a few times uh, in regards to uh, big banks putting out their analysis, but the overall adoption of a phased system. So as we said then, um, care home residents, older people, 80 plus years old, then healthcare workers, then probably those with underlying medical conditions like obesity or diabetes, these types of things, and then the rest of the population. So this is a very long period of time we're talking about here. Um, so hence the reason why this just being a headline that, that would be an immediate positive, well, that's kind of already happened with some of the moves that we've already seen over the last few weeks in the month of November. So just getting you up to speed there. Definitely vaccine updates, um, is something I'd continue to be very vigilant about. I mean, this week, there certainly are some economic data points to, to keep an eye out for, culminating in on farms on Friday. But vaccine news is always going to be uh, important, uh, both in a positive fashion, if there's any more uh, developments in terms of uh, approval statuses that come in, uh, any more quality details in the second round of testing uh, of, of certain phase trialing. Uh, and then if there's any negative surprises, of course, something that just comes up uh, that was not anticipated. So I definitely would remain vigilant on that front. Um, just so you're aware, over the weekend, the NYC school system is set to reopen. And the reason I'm just pointing that out is that it is the largest, uh, of course, in the US. Uh, so that coming despite the closure that it saw just a few weeks ago. Moving over then, I'm going to talk um, from vaccines to, to COVID uh, government plans on how to contain the actual virus. And this is looking predominantly at the UK. Uh, and this has come as Boris Johnson, as I'm sure you might have read, has come up against great resistance from a number of Conservative members in regards to how stringent then uh, this latest tiering system that's going to be adopted post then the lockdown that we're in to end on December 2nd. Uh, and uh, the main reasoning there that they have is that it's going to inappropriately penalise certain areas which is going to have quite devastating economic repercussions. So as many as 100 members of Johnson's Conservative Party are unhappy, surprisingly, with this three-tier system, uh, fearing it's too harsh. As a concession to persuade Tories to back the strategy, the government has promised that regulations would automatically expire, expire in February uh, under what he's calling a sunset clause. Before then, MPs will be given a chance to vote on whether to extend the rules in January uh, at this point. So worth worth keeping an eye on at the moment as Boris tries to manage his own political party. Um, moving away from that, on the Brexit side of things, uh, the saga rolls on. Um, we had a lot of commentary. The person they kind of sent out to do media rounds at the weekend on Sunday was the Foreign Secretary Dominic Rabb. Uh, he came out and said that the EU negotiators, British and EU negotiators, had been showing pragmatism and good faith during the recent talks. And there's a deal to be done potentially this week, said Dominic uh, Rabb, saying he's upbeat as talks enter the final few days. Negotiations, they are continuing with officials, uh, I believe, um, face to face, given the fact that they had to move virtual at one point last week because a European official uh, contracting COVID resulting in a lot of um, social distancing and, and so on, waiting out um, in order to see that through. but. Overall, what do I think of this? Uh, I still don't think they're going to get a deal this week. I've said this many times. Uh, I still don't think we're at a real pressure point where um, politicians are going to fold and really make the types of concessions that would constitute a deal. Although I still believe that that will happen, uh, I don't think it's going to happen as, as soon as this week. So again, something to just keep an eye on. Looking at oil, uh, I did mention this um, 
briefly that we'd look at the oil chart. So before we do, let's just get up to speed on what the news flow is. Uh, and a panel of OPEC plus ministers couldn't reach an agreement on whether to delay January's oil output increase, leaving the matter unresolved before a full meeting of the cartel and its allies today and tomorrow. So apparently what happened was um, Saudis and Russia were putting quite a lot of pressure to get an early uh, discussions underway yesterday, but they, they failed to really reach any type of coordinated agreement. Um, now, most participants in that informal online discussion on Sunday evening last night um, supported maintaining production curves at current levels into the first quarter, according to a delegate. Now, that would be what markets are expecting, which is the current supply pack between OPEC Plus to just be rolled over for another three months effectively to cover Q1. Uh, and that, of course, as we know, being because of the fact that COVID is still quite rampant in areas like North America, but it has also led to quite strict restrictions in mainland Europe, the UK and so on, although those are going to be softening over the weeks ahead is what people are anticipating. Nonetheless, though, in order to secure a firm support for oil prices, they want to just roll this over for another three months. Anything less than that, then price of oil is going to collapse pretty quickly. Um, the other thing here was that the Russian deputy Prime Minister and Energy Minister Alexander Novak spoke in favour of postponing the supply hike. So that's a good thing. Russia is incredibly important in order to backstop any deal, given how large they are. So the Saudis will be happy with that. Um, however, the UAE and Kazakhstan have said that they are opposed to that being the case. The other key name that a lot of people tend to look at because of their lack of uh, dearing or complying to the general supply pact is Iraq. Iraq has not asked for an exemption from OPEC plus limits on the country's oil output for fear that an increase in production might actually cause crude prices to fall, which would be self-harming for them. Um, so they're continuing to toe the line, at least for now. So um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll update you uh, as the morning goes on about specific dates and I'll share some of the live feeds from, from the meetings that they've got uh, with OPEC that are happening today. But if we look at the chart, this, this definitely could be important uh, in regard to markets have definitely priced in uh, a rollover of the supply pact. If I just make my oil chart a bit bigger for a moment. So remember on the daily chart, um, we, we broke above that really uh, key area that saw a decent breakout of price action on the upside last week, which is around that summer high, uh, which was also that March 2nd uh, low at the time. And that, co that created a break above 43.78 and we ran all the way up to around 46.26, so a decent push on from that point. Since then though, we have backed off a little bit. You can see here, um, a little bit of weakness seen uh, in overnight session, the oil equity correlation uh, fairly tight at the moment, tied to just general uh, kind of economic sensitivity overall. Um, and it's come off, but it has recovered and we're back down to the base of the kind of range that had been forming since really the middle of last week after that initial breakout that we had. Uh, on the downside, I mean, could we get back down to these lower levels? And that lower level really on the daily would be quite key, which would be a, a firm area of support back to the initial point that created the powerful breakout, which is kind of more on a daily around 43.78. So if we start getting down to around these sorts of levels here, which is close to around the S2 and that high we had on the 24th could be quite interesting. But to get down there, which is another dollar lower than where we are at the moment, and we're already down 83 cents. I think you've really got to start having um, kind of uh, the discussions from the OPEC meeting hinting towards the fact that they're finding it hard to get a deal done. If that starts to do the rounds, those kinds of noises, then oil, I think, could definitely move lower today. An inability to enforce that rollover, um, oil's got to take back some of these recent gains. But don't forget, the base scenario is they do agree to the three months. Um, if they were to go as far as six months, I think now that has kind of, uh, we've moved away from six months to center around three. So rolling out for six would definitely be a, a short-term catalyst intraday for more positive crude prices. If that were to um, happen, I'd be looking up for a, a quick run and back up towards 55.71, that previous high on the 25th, and um, what we had at the end of last week, uh, perhaps even a push on back towards this initial high that we've seen um, in recent months. 
so yeah definitely something to be aware of as soon as today uh, and then going forward into tomorrow as well all right quick look at the the calendar for this week what have we got so one thing to be aware of uh, christine lagarde does speak later on today uh, at 10 a.m european policy uh, center forum um, it is interesting from a european perspective uh, you've got a november flash cpi uh, which is expected to show another decline in prices uh, and that of course coming ahead of the December important ECB meeting uh, this is on Tuesday session uh, you can see here today we've got uh, Christine Lagarde is speaking as I just mentioned uh, her and several of her colleagues um, are scheduled to speak this week and this will be the last opportunity before their kind of quote silent period to signal their intentions for what they intend to do for that December meeting where the market is expected that fairly large 500 or so billion euro top up to their current PEP program. So be interested to keep an eye out for what she has to say, particularly in context of the fact that the dollar index at the moment is trading at its lowest level since April of 2018, which if anything is the main reason of why euro keeps grinding up towards that key 120 area again so it'd be interesting to see if she tries to counteract that with some of her comments later on this morning um, otherwise just running through this calendar you've got the rba rate decision uh, seemingly the previous course of actions that they've taken with rates and, and qb are paying off so not really, really expecting any real definitive change there um, we then get these manufacturing pmis coming out on tuesday but these are final readings so nothing too shocking to be aware of there uh, given the final prints for november uh, but on Tuesday, you do get the Fed Chairman Powell and Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin appear before the Senate Banking Committee. They'll also be speaking uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday. Now, obviously, this could be quite interesting because if you think about it, um, Mnuchin has been talking about refusing to extend the Fed's emergency facilities. So the dynamic between them, obviously, is going to be quite interesting to see as they host that event. Uh, of late there has been obviously a little bit of attention because Powell's definitely been wanting although being underutilized in those tools to keep them on the table to alleviate any pent up kind of concern that the market might show under the current downside risks emanating from the developing COVID situation in the US so that could be quite an interesting dialogue to keep an eye out for overall though probably not expecting too much then Tuesday you start getting things like ISM manufacturing don't forget then that means on Wednesday we get ADP then we get the non-manufacturing ISM on Thursday so the usual suite of US data that runs us in then to non-farm payrolls which is coming on Friday now headline change in payrolls is expected to show a print of 500,000 now 500,000 uh, that's jobs created so it's still a positive number. However, that number is decelerating. Uh, and that comes in step with two increases we've seen in the week to week initial jobless claims, which is anticipated to happen again this week. So how important payrolls is as an individual figure? I'm not so sure because ultimately it will probably will show a degree of job growth, but in the period ahead, given the fact that now we're starting to phase in increasing amounts of lockdown as that uh, outbreak of COVID-19 goes from Midwest America to nationwide, resulting in more people and their loss of jobs, particularly areas in like hospitality and leisure and so on, then I don't think it's that unsurprising to see this headline figure slowing. So I don't actually think payrolls is that big a deal, but certainly as ever, it will be the main crescendo to end the week as, as far as the set pieces are concerned. Um, so that really uh, is about it. So, you know, with with payrolls, then uh, you know, a note I made here was uh, the following that even if uh, do note that if there is more positive vaccine news to come, uh, then a moderate deterioration in job growth would likely be overlooked by the market. Uh, and thus uh, a, that reverting back to the gulf between forward-looking markets on mainstream and a deterioration of the situation underlying in reality on uh, mainstream. And this is what I mean, what I'm trying to say was that the jobs data is gonna, it's gonna slow. If anything, it's gonna get worse, but it does come in context. Of course, stocks being up at 
up at highs. So we're back in that era again of that kind of disconnect being apparent between the kind of the harsh um, kind of realities in, in real world terms against forward looking markets um, who are anticipating things like the ECB, for example, to have to do more. Uh, and that being, of course, a, a very supportive factor. Uh, the final article I just quickly wanted to mention, uh, I definitely don't see this as something tangible for right here, right now, but I think it is meaningful as far as the transition going from Trump uh, to Biden. Uh, the one thing to have a look at, there's quite a good article on the FT today, which I'll share about Georgia Senate race. There's two seats there uh, and they, uh, the Republicans have to win both in order then to maintain the Senate. No, not many people have really been too focused on this, but obviously if they don't and the Democrats win, that ties them and then the casting vote from Kamala Harris, obviously who's a Democrat, would then constitute a blue wave. So it definitely is something that needs watching very closely. Um, but well, this is an article that I wanted to just quickly touch upon and it's about um, the EU seeking to forge a new alliance with the US to bury the tensions of the Trump era and meet the challenges of China, according to a draft plan from Brussels that was circulating over the weekend. Um, so for me, some were, as I've talked about in briefings over many months ago, um, there was some speculation that China might have actually have preferred a Trump second term rather than the Biden victory for this very reason is that through the era of Trump protectionism, um, generally had isolated the US, not just against uh, China, but uh, isolated itself from its other key um, Western allies, uh, predominantly that in mainland Europe, for example, uh, as well as the UK and others. So here then comes a more challenging issue for, for China, which I don't think is a deal breaker. I think it just means that they're they'll come up against more stern challenges. And that's because if uh, Europe and the US can unite behind a, a, a coordinated front, that's going to be much more um, challenging for, for China to take on that kind of long-term play uh, and that global ambition of taking over as the world-leading trading partner. So quite an interesting development there uh, on that article worth having a read if you get, if you get time. All right. That is it. I'm going to leave you to get on with things. I'm going to wish you a great week ahead. Um, again, hope you had a great weekend and I'll see you same time tomorrow. Thanks very much.